Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's Provost Forum. Please at this time welcome to the uh, lectern our Provost, Dr. Elizabeth Dooley. Good afternoon and thank each of you all for coming to the Provost Forum. I know today at UCF sometimes our sight become a little blurry. But just think about it. Having a blurred vision doesn't mean you're not gonna see in the future or see the next day. I want us to keep that in mind because we are in transition. There is healing that has to occur. And I can't stand be before you all as the provost and ignore what is happening. One of the things that I'm starting to adopt is to say we have to do better to be better. And in order to do, do that, each of us standing together united can and will make all the difference. Because we're here today and we're looking at our collective impact when we have these forums, that should indicate that we're moving forward. If we have an option to pause or cancel events, in my mind, that's non-negotiable. And why is that non-negotiable? We have 68,000 students. We have faculty members. We have alum. We have staff. When I come in the morning, I see the, the, the buses riding in front of Millican Hall, and I see each of the students hopping off the bus as if they have purpose, and they do indeed have purpose. And we're here because our students are here, and we need each other. And I want to compel each of us. I want to compel each of us to move forward together. We are still moving forward to reach preeminence and become top three in the SUS. And I hear it over campus, why are we so metric driven? Do we always have to talk about metrics? Well, we don't, but just think about what preeminence means. And when I think about us, it's really beyond the word, it's being distinguished. Being distinguished in how we treat our colleagues being distinguished in how we lift lives and livelihoods, making a difference for many. Those are the things that are important to us. We talk about scale times excellence equals impact. It's not about the formula alone. It's about the number of lives and people that we can touch. It's about our research agenda and how many new trails can we blaze through the talent of our faculty coming to UCF. So it's much bigger than the word preeminence. But we also know that being preeminence wins us funding. And how many of you all can think about something in terms of how we can invest those dollars? Just raise your hand. Just, just raise your hands. So we can invest those dollars. And so while you hear me and others and deans talking about preeminence and being top three in performance, it's not all about the metrics. It's the metrics that gets us to where we want to be. And we want to go together. I also want to highlight that it's through partnerships. One of the things that attracted me to the University of Central Florida, not only when I looked at the position description where they talked about being bold, but one of the things that they talked about that resonated with me was the partnership University. Many individuals talk about the partnership, but we're not having conversations with our partners. But at UCF, we're having those conversations with our partners. And it's the mutual benefit. Each side is finding purpose. Each side is finding value in the partnership. And as we find the values and, and, and the, the, the attributes of each, we realize that it is collective, and we realize that it's impact. We have our partners here today from the foundation. 
And I want to applaud our foundation because they're going to talk about the success that they've achieved, but this community has helped the foundation achieve the milestones that they have put before us. So I want us to applaud them before Michael takes the stage. And the reason why I think an applaud is appropriate, because they listen. They have listened to what the needs are for UCF to move forward, and they've gone out to cultivate the individuals who can help us. But here's one of the important things that Michael and his team will share about us, is what the individual wants. What's the passion? Align their passion with those things that matter to all of us, and it will, again, that's one of the things that make a difference. I don't want to stand before you long, but we have a special person here, Mr. Nelson Marchiola. He's an individual who finds values, value in the big things, but here's what's most important to me. He sees and understands the value in the small things. And one of the things that we know, little becomes much. He's planting seeds. He's actually contributed $5,000 prize to faculty members. He's planting seeds in individual faculty members' research. And the research that either impacts the community and students, those seeds are now starting to blossom. I want to applaud him for his contribution and his valuing the little things. And so at this time, I would like to welcome Mike Morsberger, Vice President for Advancement and CEO of the UCF Foundation. Give him an applause and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm uh, really uh, glad to be here and grateful, and I, and I appreciate uh, um, the remarks you made, uh, not just on behalf of the entire advancement team, uh, but as it relates to listening and to um, being direct uh, about the challenges we face. Uh, we had an alumni executive committee and that alumni board executive committee meeting this morning. Earlier, we had an investment committee meeting of the foundation, uh, and we addressed the reality of what's happened here in the past few weeks uh, head on. Uh, the last thing Dale Whitaker said to me um, over at Burnett House um, on the night everything uh, happened and he was out with uh, the students uh, and I, uh, I told him that we were going to miss him and he said, uh, you never forget this institution is bigger than any one person. And he said, tomorrow you get up early and work harder because that's what we do. That's what UCF's about. And uh, I guess we'll all be a little haunted by what could have been for those of us that had the pleasure of working with Dale. But there are 68,000 students here, you know, counting on us. There are 13,000 faculty and staff. There's an entire region of the state, if not this corner of the United States that's counting on us to move forward. And, um, and we believe advancement, fundraising, uh, and the engagement of various constituencies, alumni, parents, corporations, foundations, citizens in the area, season ticket holders, um, is one of the ways that we can influence revenue uh, at the institution. And we can't do that alone. Uh, fundraising, uh, old sales trick at meetings is to ask a, a giant room full of people uh, who here among us is in the sales business. Uh, of course, the correct response is for every hand to go up. The same thing with fundraising. Uh, we need everybody. Um, just as uh, Liz Klonoff in research and the deans uh, count on faculty to help bring in uh, grants and, and new partnerships, it's the same thing for, for advancement. Uh, without the, oh, there's Liz right there, just paying. <laughs> Did you hear that? I just paid you a compliment in front of the room. <laughs> um, but something else uh, Elizabeth said is important too, uh, at least as it relates to listening and as, as it relates to philanthropy. It's not about our needs, it's about their needs. 
And when we can uh, decipher the needs of our donor prospects, when we learn their passions, our job is to try to play matchmaker and plug them into the right projects. And, uh, and we're doing a better and better job at that, and that's what I'm going to, uh, to illustrate here. Let me start with um, some collective impact metrics. Um, you all know we're in a campaign, the Ignite campaign, an eight-year initiative with about four months left. And that goal of the eight-year campaign to raise $500 million by June 30th, uh, excuse me, by, yeah, June 30th of this year. We've also got some very specific metrics that are associated with the strategic plan that is in a little slightly different timeline. To build the UCF endowment to $175 million, to increase the number of existing and committed philanthropically endowed professorships and chairs from 65 to 80, increase annual giving uh, among alumni from 15,000 to 30,000, increase the number of engaged alumni from approximately 8,000 to 16,000. Uh, and the good news is that we're making progress in all those uh, areas as will be demonstrated shortly. Um, as of December 31st, we've raised $479.5 million. Um, actually, that deserves a round of applause. How about <laughs> so um, I'm pleased to tell you, we decided as a strategic decision um, that uh, we, would, we would stop reporting on a weekly or monthly update on where we were in the campaign uh, and keep things quiet or silent in the last six months of the campaign so that we'd have uh, an opportunity to celebrate the breakthrough number uh, at homecoming in the fall, in October. Um, I can tell you with a great deal of confidence that we are gonna get to 500 million. Uh, I believe we will get there um, sometime later this month or next month in April, um, which means in the last 100 days of the campaign, um, we'll be doing everything we can to get everybody under the tent as much as possible, all the alumni we can, all the parents, all the students, all the faculty, staff, um, all donors make a difference. Um, and um, and we're, we're very excited about where we're going. As you can see from the chart here, over the course of the eight-year period, we've had some pretty substantial and steady growth. Just one note for those of you that wonder about that first column uh, relative to grandfathering. Uh, that's basically where we take gifts that are worth $100,000 or greater since the last campaign ended and the new one began, and we basically take those major donors and roll them into the new campaign. You do that not to pump up numbers. It's to make sure those people don't feel excluded, like they didn't get cheated out of being something part of something historic. We should finish this fiscal year well over $100 million, which of course gets us to the magic number of 500. But what I wanted to point out here before I introduce the next member of the team is the gray area. The gray area is gifts of $500,000 or less. Um, and so what you'll see is a fairly consistent, there's a couple exceptions, but a fairly consistent 20 to $30 million that comes in every year from gifts of under 500,000. Now that doesn't come without a lot of work. But the yellow bar is where the numbers are increasing most dramatically. So these are gifts over a half million or more. We call them principal gifts. And that's where a lot of our prioritization is relative to time and in working with you. Um, we don't wanna chase uh, exclusively $25 and $50 gifts. We don't want to exclusively depend on direct mail or special events. We need strategic partnerships. We need truly uh, donors as investors. And so with that as a little bit of a backdrop, I think Bill Dean is next to talk a little bit more about that threshold of principal gifts and the power of the turn off. Did this go off? No, it's back. Uh, so without further ado, here's Bill. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully you can 
hear me. Uh, I'm not too worried. Uh, my first job out of college was as an admissions officer, so I'm used to or got used to speaking to a auditorium filled with high school students. So um, if you can't hear me, you just let me know. Um, <clears throat> So as Mike said, I want to talk a little bit about the role of principal gifts. My role in the office is uh, associate vice president for principal gifts. Now, this doesn't mean that I get all of the million dollar plus uh, possible donors, what we call prospects. But it does mean that I try to keep my eye on that ball, and I try to work with all of the gift officers and any number of volunteers and administrators to sort of make sure we're doing what we need to do with those folks who have that potential. Um, so uh, these two charts that you're going to see here uh, actually are provided by what's called the Education Advisory Board, or EAB. And what it really, I, I'm not going to dwell on the details of each chart. What I really want to get at is that they, um, uh, there is a lot of research out on, in this area, and the charts themselves, uh, uh, so those that raise uh, the most each year have a 60 to 70 percent of the revenue coming from principal gifts. It's, uh, it's not unusual for um, especially universities that are in uh, billion dollar plus campaigns to have 60, 70, 80 percent of their attainment come from this level of, of giving. Um, but one of the other things that this does is that by uh, raising sort of 60 to 70 percent of the revenue in this way, uh, you see a seven-fold return on every dollar of expenditures. So it's actually really quite a good investment. And so return on investment is a, a key portion of this. Um, I would add that um, uh, being able to achieve at that level, certainly with principal gifts, they tend to be the kinds of things that can really move the mark, really move the ball, to use a sports analogy. Every gift is important, and every gift has impact. But gifts at these levels tend to be the things that really revolutionize uh, whatever program or activity that uh, benefits from them. Um, uh, I'm going to flip to the next one, um, because one of the areas that I um, like to talk about a little bit is how we're doing with regard to endowment. Um, the endowment value at the end of uh, December was uh, a, a little over $152 million. Um, uh, we do have a goal of uh, part of the collective impact uh, strategic plan to have $175 million in uh, our endowment, hopefully by the year 2021. Uh, we are actively working in that direction. Um, I want to depart a little bit from the statistics because um, I want you to understand the value of endowment or, or maybe a, uh, cite a slight or small example of what I'm talking about. Uh, an endowment isn't just a different kind of an account. Um, the Lucasian Chair at the University of Cambridge in the UK the chair of mathematics. It's been occupied by Sir Isaac Newton and Stephen Hawking. It has existed since 1663. It is, it is probably the, one of the closest things that one can do in establishing an endowment to immortality that you can do. Uh, it's a very important aspect of uh, what, it, what it means to be a fundraiser. And, um, I should also add that uh, universities typically are among the most long-lived of institutions that you see around. So the, the chance for an endowment to be making a difference, and if we do our job right from a stewardship perspective and have the background and understand the motivation of the donor and have that on record, then literally 100, 200 years from now, the people who receive a scholarship that someone endowed will know who that person was and why they gave. So um, let me go back quickly now to uh, what's going on with the endowment. Um, 
There is and has been significant uh, volatility in the market. Of course, part of what affects the value of our endowment is the appreciation in the market. It is invested in an, in an endowment uh, investment pool. And um, it has been effective uh, uh, the last several years, uh, so a decade or so, five years have had double digit returns, um, but four of the years have had negative or flat returns. So it is subject to that kind of up and down and won't always stay the same. Uh, we do have a dedicated group of people on our um, a board of directors who really keep an eagle eye on how that is progressing and what we're investing in. Um, there is pressure, especially at a younger university like this, to focus on shorter term solutions and projects. Um, the donor base, uh, it's not, not surprising. Uh, often donors who give to endowment um, are, are older. They're, they're at that point where they want to leave a legacy and this is a way to do it. Uh, and so we have a younger donor base, which sometimes is prohibitive for things like endowment. Um, donors also more and more want to see, um, well, most donors want to see impact, but the idea of an immediate impact means usually current use kinds of dollars. Um, and um, Savvy investors uh, believe sometimes that they can earn higher returns than if they invest uh, in an endowment uh, at a university. Uh, again, our endowment philosophy has to take into account that we anticipate existing for centuries as opposed to even a long-term individual investor is really talking about a lifetime or maybe a little beyond a lifetime if you're thinking of um, your children or, or beyond. Um, we can go to, yes, the next one. Um, so one of the bigger aspects of, of where we're focusing when it comes to endowment growth is in fact faculty excellence. And before I forget, I'd like to do a little bit of a shout out to Dr. Jasinski. Um, my colleague Patrick Crowley and I work with her to try to ensure that we understand what is going on with regard to uh, the kind of support the provost office gives to faculty. Um, uh, but um, we currently have about 65 endowed professorships and chairs either existing or committed. Um, and when I say committed, we have some pledges on there where they have not built up yet and they're not accessible, but we have people who are saying this is what we want to do. Um, and just to give you a sense of the pipeline, we have currently six solicitations with responses pending. The asks are out there. Two of them would be new professorships and four uh, solicitations are occurring right now for an endowment in the India Center, which would provide the, uh, the faculty support there. And we also plan ahead so that there are 10 planned solicitations, um, including nine that would be new and one that would be for the India Center. So we are more and more uh, highlighting this and working with our gift officers and working with um, faculty to make these kinds of things happen. Um, again, one last thought on endowment. While this is not specifically um, uh, professorships. Uh, another member of the provost office that I'd like to thank in particular is Dr. Jeff Jones, uh, as well as Natalie Chandia, because I've worked with them in um, uh, UCF Global, but also Direct Connect, and in particular, one of the largest umbrella of endowments uh, that exists were created fairly recently by the Johnson Scholarship Foundation. It's over $3 million worth of endowment for the Direct Connect program and uh, Jeff has been really helpful in making sure I can communicate back to the Johnson Scholarship Foundation. So um, this is just one end of what we do, and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Julie Stroh, uh, with regard to um, the broader audience that we often work with. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. Well, as Bill said, I'm Julie Stroh, and my areas of responsibility as Senior Associate Vice President for Advancement are specifically engagement and annual giving, so we'll talk a little bit about that end of the spectrum. 
Um, I would be remiss if I didn't begin by thanking Mike and Nelson for the investment they have made in engagement and annual giving programs since I came to UCF in 2015 and uh, Mike came to UCF in 2015. We had no annual giving program when I arrived at UCF and that of course is a very important uh, front end of the pipeline. Without annual giving we don't have major gifts and without major gifts we don't have principal gifts. So these things are all important. Um, metric goals for engagement and annual giving were established for the first time at UCF in 2016, and that was because of collective impact. So there had been no metric fo focus on engagement and annual giving. Of course, without an annual giving program uh, uh, on really a full-time basis, that would make sense, but our engagement work was not, um, not being looked at through the lens of metrics. Um, engagement and annual giving really represent the front end of the philanthropy pipeline, uh, as I alluded to a minute ago. Um, without engagement, we don't have annual gifts. Without annual gifts, we don't have major gifts. And without major gifts, we don't have principal gifts and, and planned gifts as well. Um, constituents become engaged and make an annual gift before progressing to a major gift. That would be a gift over $25,000 or before making a principal gift and in our terms that would be $500,000. Um, as you can see by looking at the chart, which I can see in little form, you can actually see up on the screen, but we have blown past our engagement metric. Um, of uh, reaching 16,000 engaged alumni, alumni by 2020, we are actually at 34,000 as of the end of last year. And as I mentioned to the group um, with whom we met to prepare for this meeting, that is largely because of our ability to capture communication engagement through technology. So technology is a good thing for many, many reasons. Um, we are on track to increase the number of alumni who make an annual gift to 30,000 by 2020. And if you think about our alumni base, which is fast approaching 300,000, that would be about 10% of our alumni base. And that is a lofty, lofty goal for UCF. Uh, to give you a sense of perspective, nationally, one in 10 alumni give every year, and that's kind of the number we're aspiring to. Um, and one in four alumni give some time. They may not give every year, but they give some time in their lifetime as alumni. And we do like to say that we're gonna talk about constituencies other than alumni, but alumni are a university or college's only permanent constituency because students come and go and faculty come and go and administration and staff come and go. But once someone graduates or receives an alumni designation, that is for life. Uh, so important to think about how important that group of individuals is. Um, our work in building a culture of philanthropy at UCF does not focus exclusively on alumni. As I said, there are other constituencies. Um, Elizabeth certainly um, mentioned several of them, as did Mike in his remarks. So it is not just alumni on whom we focus. Um, all constituencies are important to us. So expanding connections beyond alumni um, is of particularly, particular importance in a metropolitan public research university where the community is such an important connection to us. Corporations and foundations are such important connections for us. Many businesses and people adopt an institution like UCF as their hometown university. So we cannot forget, we cannot forget constituents other than alumni. Um, our student philanthropy program, and LaToya is sitting in the back there. Hi, LaToya. Uh, LaToya Jackson, who actually uh, created that program. We are in year three of our student philanthropy program. We boasted 1,405 donors in uh, FY18. And LaToya, what is our goal? Our stretch goal is 2,000 this year, 2,200? 2,200, which I think we started with 1,750 as our goal. So every time I ask, it's gone up. So this is year three of a program and is really our first attempt to engage students in philanthropy through philanthropy education programs, which are managed by, by LaToya. Um, young alumni donors, those who represent one third of our alumni population have steadily grown in number and you can see that from the, uh, from the slide up on the screen. And let me reiterate that one third of our alumni base is 32 or under. That is very, a very unique situation to UCF and to other young institutions. 
uh, parent donors, uh, a group that we're engaging um, very, very intentionally. And Heather, is Heather here in the room? Heather Janad? Heather? Hi, Heather. Uh, Annie O'Donnell in Heather's office manages that program and uh, has done a wonderful job of not only engaging parents in the university community, but also engaging them in philanthropically supporting the institution. And I would be remiss if I didn't remind all of you that um, parents sit in very high places at UCF. Two of our trustees are not alumni, but our parents, Bob Garvey and Bev C. So we, uh, we pay close attention to that re relationship. And of course, of course um, Bob and Bev were both made honorary alumni last year at our Shining Nights Alumni Award Ceremony. Um, Although the number of donors in each of these categories are important and we do pay attention to numbers of donors from a metric perspective, we also look at uh, revenue that is generated by these programs. So annual giving revenue has increased 49% since 2016. Having a program has a lot to do with that. And we're proud that sort of all costs in for my area result in a 31 cent cost to raise a dollar. So we feel, we feel very, um, very pleased and um, uh, pleased and um, inspired by the direction in which we have been moving. So we are going to go to the next slide, and I have the exceptional pleasure of asking each of you to turn on your clickers. Isn't that fabulous that I get to do that? So clickers ready, folks? Ask, ask a neighbor if you're not sure what to, what to do. <laughs> that would be my advice. So here's a, I think we have two different kinds of clickers in the room, so I can't guarantee that one set of instructions will, will match the other. So here's a um, Mythbusters question. A principal gift donor, and we're going to say at the million dollar level, although our threshold is 500,000, makes seven or more gifts to an organization before he or she gives at the million dollar level. What would you all guess is the average size of the first gift made by that million dollar donor? So the answer is $250 or less. So this, I hope, is a, as an illustration for all of you as to how important annual giving programs are because that's where our principal donors start. Um, as, as Mike Morseberger likes to say, fundraising is a long game. Uh, many, many small gifts are made before a gift is made at the principal level. And with that, I thank you so much for your time and I'll turn it back over to Mike. Yeah, you might be surprised on the alumni thing, and I don't want to, um, to discount the importance of, of alumni, but uh, again, make the point about other constituents. If you were, if, if I was to put up a list of the 25 largest donors in the history of UCF, only five of them would be alumni. So 20 are individuals uh, and organizations um, who are from the community or had a desire to partner with us in a different way that might, again, it, 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 it might be uh, uh, sort of counterintuitive uh, as to these things. So speaking of constituents, next sort of myth buster participation opportunity. True or false, the majority of philanthropic giving to education in the United States comes from corporations and foundations. Wow, that was quick. The answer is A, true. Um, we, uh, uh, I, I expected those, those results. <laughs> um, actually, the 27-2018 VSC survey reported that 56% of giving to higher education came from corporations, foundations, and other organizations, benevolent organizations. UCF mirrors this um, trend with about 59% of its gifts coming uh, from such entities in this campaign. Um, I should mention, however, that this constituent carve-outs are never perfect. Sometimes the corporations that give big are the CEO 
is in fact an alum or the CEO is a parent that would make them dual or sometimes three-time constituents. So keep in mind, anybody that expresses an interest in UCF is a potential prospect. Uh, and we'll take them small, we'll take them large. Um, um, we're, we're trying to engage them in a longer term uh, relationship. Next up on Mythbusters, true or false, most individuals give because they want the tax benefit. You all should know this one. True or false? Okay, that's good. The answer is B, <laughs> B false. Uh, the U.S. Trust 2018 study of high net worth uh, individuals in philanthropy shows that only around 15 to 17 percent uh, really consider this a major benef uh, uh, benefit of giving. Uh, more often than not, when you li see the list of journals that we read, like the Chronicle of Philanthropy, um, the number one driver is engagement, passion, involvement, um, and uh, the number one indicator of those things, again, is people being involved in the life of the institution. Alumni, they have a little bit of that pull. Parents is the, is the, uh, uh, the number one uh, uh, growth market relative to philanthropy in higher ed. So don't count them out, even if they're helping their, their children with tuition. I think this will be my last myth buster. No, I got a couple more. Um, what is the cost to raise a dollar at UCF? All in, uh, Julie gave you a number relative to alumni engagement. All in cost to raise a dollar for the advancement team. Pretty good. C is the right answer, 25 cents. So, so for every quarter we get in revenue and funding uh, to, to pay for the advancement office, usually a dollar comes back. There are highs and lows in different colleges and schools, different disciplines and areas, but just to give you a sense of what it really costs to do our work. Moving on to the next one. True or false, the UCF Foundation can write a check for anything the university needs. <laughs> God forbid you get this wrong. Uh, <laughs> no, I, but, but here's the thing though, it, this was intended to start a little bit of a conversation. So the answer is, is B, false. Um, um, we, we cannot uh, just write a check to any place. It's a misconception sometimes because the last name in the title there is foundation, the UCF foundation. You might think that with all these assets that we've accumulated that, uh, that we're like the Carnegie Foundation or uh, 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 the Ford Foundation. Uh, no, we are a pass through to some degree. We are a DSO, a direct support organization whose only purpose is serving you. And, um, and so in fact, uh, we are limited in where we can write checks, where we can distribute money in large part based on what donors tell us. 98 to 99% of all the gifts we receive are restricted. Donors tell us specifically where they want it to go. Uh, that's a challenge. We're trying to find ways to bring in more unrestricted support so we can better serve the needs of the institution. But the truth is um, that's, that's what donors want and that's what we give them. Um, so I think for the next myth buster and little section I'm gonna introduce Karen Cochran, our Senior Associate VP of Development. Thank you, Mike. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Um, as Mike said, I have the last Mythbuster, but I have some other fun activities for you as well. Um, true or false, as at UCF, large donors usually focus their support on only one area of the university. Hmm, a little bit closer. This one is actually false. So not only at UCF, but historically at other institutions I've served, what we find is that engagement translates into multiple touches within the university. And actually, when we as development officers or as entities within that university tend to protect a donor, we're actually not doing us, ourselves, or the donor any favors. Because chances are, they're impressed with the organization writ large, and they want to be engaged in multiple ways that are meaningful to them. 
One example of this, uh, one of our prom examples, is that of Jim and Julia Rosengren. Um, we're particularly proud of their most recent gift, which encompasses a number of critical areas, from the PTSD Restores Clinic, to turtle research, to modern languages. But rather than me describing how this gift came about, we thought it would be best if we asked Dean Michael Johnson up to come up and talk about how the gift came to be. Um, Dean Johnson was an integral part of that gift solicitation, the negotiations, the long-term relationship, and he really has uh, the perspective of what it's like, whether it's dean or faculty member, to be on the receiving end of a wonderful gift. So with that, I will turn it over to Dean Johnson. Thanks, Karen. My part of this, honestly, is mostly just to do no harm. Um, and, and that's really not too much of a joke. Jim Rosengren, originally just Jim, um, he married Julia during this process. Jim Rosengren was discovered by a regional um, gift officer who contacted him and instead of being turned down was you know, greeted with a kind of, I'm, I'm happy the university has grown up to the point where it's reaching out to alumni. He was at a time in his life when he was interested in doing some good things for us. I think what really brought him to the table was that the regional gift officer you know, talked through various things that were going on and mentioned the PTSD clinic, what's now UCF Restores, headed by Deborah Beidel, and that was immediately something he really cared about, and he does really, really care about that. Um, for many good personal reasons. And um, that made him willing and interested to come to the university. My part then, you know, is, is just to do something which was very straightforward. It's to welcome him, you know, to enjoy his company, to talk about how important I found this effort to be, um, to welcome his friendship and support, to be available when he was in town, of course. and. Um, Frankly, not a lot more. He gave money, and then he and Julia eventually together were giving money because they were introduced to parts of the university that really mattered to them. So probably there were two important things I did, and this is in the do no harm category. The first is, um, you know, facilitate his introduction to Deborah Beidel. You know, it was talking to her that he really understood what she was trying to do, led to their willingness to give. But then secondly, I firmly believe in a donor-centric approach to giving. It's perhaps easier in a college like sciences, which is a big part of arts and sciences types of disciplines. We don't have a natural corporate constituency, except in a few specific areas, the way, say, business or engineering or optics do. We have a lot of neat things going on. We can't tell who's going to be interested in, you know, PTSD work or the sea turtle work on the coast or the kinds of opportunities given to students when they have a chance to learn a modern language, open their eyes to the rest of the world. These are all things these guys are interested in, but who would know? So it's really important to me that you know, my gift officers or the gift officers I work with know that I firmly believe if they talk to somebody and they say their interest is athletics, I forgot to mention that one, that that's, that's a good thing. I've got no interest in trying to say, no, 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 you know, tell them what I really need is something, 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 and I do have something, 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 but I don't, you know, they, they get the chance to hear that in the conversations, not as a, I want you to give to this, but you know, they, they hear the things that we're doing and sometimes it lights a fire. Where it lights a fire is their business. Um, and the, I think it's really, my job, it's really important for people that I work with to know that I'm delighted if they find a donor whose interest is another part of the university, you know, it goes around and it comes around. I, you know, I hope that everybody else feels that way. We get our share um, from other parts of the university. I think that's about it. Okay, so it was mostly get out of the way. Thank you, Dean Johnson. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank you publicly for your yeoman's work this week in North Carolina. Um, many of you may know that we actually were planning to be on the road uh, with President Whitaker. And those plans had been formed long ago. And we'd been out in the area drumming up interest and securing people to attend. And when February hit, um, much to what 
Provost Dooley said, we immediately said we have to go, not to ask for money, but to listen. And being put in that situation, we also knew we would have a stronger impact if we were able to take an academic leader with us. And Dean Johnson stepped up literally at a moment's notice, changed his calendar, and flew to North Carolina and spent Monday and Tuesday with us, and now we're asking him to do this. But it really is about the partnership. Um, I hear that his remarks were extremely um, warmly welcomed, and I know that his willingness to do, and to do that and to stand with us made us all that more credible. It's about a long-term game here. It's about relationships. It's about being there at times like these when you need to listen. And we need to bring that back to the institution and we need to share that. And that's really one of the key roles we see is listening and bringing that back. Um, is, mm -hmm. they wanted to know what happens next, what's happening with my university. I actually think it provides an opportunity right now because people are listening, they're curious to fill the void, to give them the facts, to let them know we're moving on. And, um, and, and, and I, there's a handful of alums that are, I think, going to be almost encouraged to double down on their giving because they want to make a statement that I believe in UCF. It's my school. It won't be kicked when it's down. And uh, we're going to try to uh, encourage that kind of thinking. I mean, you, you think about it in sports analogies all the time, but I will say for some of the alums and parents and other friends, um, this is a little, this is personal. Um, and so just keep it in mind. Again, some of these things are a little counterintuitive than what you might expect. So I recently read an EAB study that said, in the last decade, the dean's percentage of time focused on fundraising has grown from 10% to 30%. And when you take that in context, here's the startling fact. It's actually projected over the next decade between 2018 and 2028 to grow to more than 50%. So again, emphasizing we can't do this without you, it really is a partnership, and it really is about us certainly being the professionals in terms of asking for the money, but making sure that we feature you as the subject matter expert. So with that, we're actually gonna pick your brain a little bit with an exercise about why you give. Um, philanthropy is not just about big dollars. You've heard how big dollars play a role in this $500 million campaign and that no doubt they'll play a role in the next large campaign. But we know that the best programs build a culture of philanthropy and that philanthropy goes from the smallest first gift to hopefully a legacy or a planned gift as donors think about what they want to leave as their legacy to UCF. Did you know that more than 2,000 faculty and staff members actually give to UCF? And that last year, you were part of a collective that accounted for more than a million dollars. So give yourselves a hand for that. It's really not about how much you give. It's about that you give. And those of us who have reg regular interfaces with foundations in particular know that one of the questions that is frequently asked is, what is your percent of faculty and staff participation? Not how much, but how many. How many individuals stand up for the institution that they come to work at and believe in? So it's really important as we go into this next exercise that we want to focus in on why you give. Why do you give? We want to learn from you about in, uh, particular instances where you may have been moved by the way in which you were thanked. 
And we want to know the ways that you're philanthropic. Philanthropy isn't just about the dollars. It could be about advocacy. It could be about um, spreading the message among your family and friends. So what you have on your tables are pre-printed sheets that have basically three groups of questions around them. The first question is, why do you give? What motivates you? The second question is, tell us a little bit about a time when you were particularly touched by a thank you you received. That may not in any way correlate to the fact it was your largest gift. It may have to do with the fact that you gave you know, $25 and you got a handwritten note from a child. And the last one is, in what ways are you philanthropic? So as I um, spoke before, those are all listed out. We want to take just about three to five minutes, talk amongst yourselves, and then what we're going to do is survey the group, certainly not each particular table, but we'll ask for a flavoring across the room so that we can get a sense of what your perspective on philanthropy is. Any questions before we begin?
One minute. All right. Can I get everybody to start wrapping it up so we can hear from you? Do I have a volunteer? Do I have a table that's willing to stand up and talk about why you give? It got really quiet. All right. Who's going to stand up and tell us why they give? All right. Thank you. So I'm a PhD student, and I give, um, oh, sorry. So I'm a PhD student here at the University of Central Florida, and I give um, because I'm passionate and committed to the mission of the organizations that I give to. And typically, I give to the ones that I have benefited from. So I feel it is my duty to give back to those who have given to me. Wonderful. And your name is? Andrea Hill. Andrea, thank you. <laughs> Somebody else? Why do you give? Now, I know your donor's in here. Dean Johnson. I already talked, so I'll do it again. Um, I give to things I believe in that I think are important. It's almost never something that I have a personal tie to, but things that I've learned of that I care about. Thank you. Anybody else before I ask for somebody to tell about a special time when they were thanked in a particularly effective way? All right, let's move on to number two. Tell me about a time when you were thanked in a very effective way. Oh, come on. We're not looking for feedback for us. Uh, Hi. I was thanked. Mike spoke before and spoke again, so I spoke before, I'll speak again. Mine would be, and you've heard me tell this story before, at a previous uh, uh, place where we lived, uh, my wife and I uh, became rather enamored with uh, a nonprofit uh, daycare center attached to a, a homeless shelter and um, um, made what we thought was a modest gift, but they didn't get a lot of gifts at all and um, uh, because we're, we love children. Um, a couple of weeks later, we, we got a... Uh, a booklet um, with 30 or 40 um, coloring uh, uh, colorings in it. Uh, children had, you know, when you have kids, you, they bring home uh, things they colored at school and you put it on the refrigerator. So we got 30 princesses and firemen and, and Disney characters that were drawn with thank you notes from the kids. Man, oh man, uh, they had us, you know, lock, stock and barrel at that point. I mean, we became very involved I eventually ended up on the board, and, and we made many more gifts. But it was the, the impact to the kids and the, and the note from the kids that, wow, just blew my mind. So that made a big difference. Great. Can I ask the person who was going to speak if she would mind? While I was in the hospital waiting to give birth, I wanted to listen to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and we turned on the radio, and of course they were doing the fun drive. So we called and we gave, and we said, we're, we're 
were waiting to have a child. They followed up and um, asked for the information about the baby and did a birth announcement on air to thank us and then sent us a little onesie with said NPR and said to, NB to WMFE's youngest donor ever. So <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Somebody else? All right. Well, I think what you're beginning to see is that these are personal. It's highly personal. And one of my favorite quotes about stewardship or thanking people is from Maya Angelou. And she said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So that really is the essence of saying thank you, right? It's really about why you give, what really motivates you, and then, you know, our job is to say thank you in a very, very meaningful way. Um, last but not least, let's take just a moment or two to talk about ways in which we're philanthropic. Do I have someone who's willing to volunteer to share their thoughts on that subject? Oh, come on. We don't bite. Well, as I said before, one of the ways, you know, money is not the only way to be philanthropic. And when I think about ways to be philanthropic, I think about um, a donor that I had the pleasure of working with at a different institution. And she came, she and her husband um, amassed wealth in New York City. He worked for a big bank. And she used to tell the story about the call from her dad the first time they made a million dollar plus gift. And her dad was a depression era baby and he did not approve at all. How in the world could you give that money away? Where in the world, where in the world did you learn to think like that? And she said, dad, I learned to think like that from you. And he said, how could, how, how could that be? He said, I have never written a check, nor will I ever be able to write a check like that. And she said, you are a physician. You are a community doctor. And I saw you get up from the table, and I saw you go back to the hospital to check on somebody that you thought wasn't going to make it. And I saw you give services, even antibiotics and drugs, to people who couldn't afford to pay you for your services. Dad, that's where I learned to be philanthropic. And that's really what we want you to hear, is that the philanthropy is not just about the money. It's really about what the money can do. And how you interact with it is very personal. It's up to you. Um, but all of us can have an impact on this great institution. So with that, I'll go to the next slide. I'm going to speed it up a little so that we have plenty of time to really talk about stewardship and how we thank people. Um, this is the five eyes of fundraising. And rather than walk you through each of these, the big takeaway from this is that there actually is a plan. It doesn't mean that every donor follows it. It doesn't mean that people don't come into the cycle at varying points. But the most important things for you to understand is that there is a path and that we try whenever possible to follow that path. Um, it is donor-centric. It is very much about making sure that we do the right thing by the donor who gives us the money so that the next time that we go to ask or we go to involve them, UCF is well-positioned to receive their philanthropy again. You know, many of us have been doing this for quite a while, and what we've seen is more and more competition in the nonprofit mark, in the nonprofit market, and so part of us, part of what we do, is make sure that we thanked the person, that the funds have been used in the way that the donor intended, that we regularly report back on that investment, because the more that we're accountable to the donor, the more likely they are to be a donor in the future. Next slide, please. So let's take just a minute to talk about prospects. 
and where they might come from. So this slide actually talks a little bit about three things that we think are necessary for someone to be a prospect for UCF. The first is capacity. Capacity. You heard Julie Stroh describe a major gift as anything over 25,000 over a five-year period for UCF. The important takeaway from the capacity piece is just because someone is, has wealth does not mean that they're a prospect for us. Just two days ago, Forbes came out with its billionaire list for this year. In the US, we have 607 billionaires who control more than $3.1 trillion in wealth. So, I want your input. A show of hands and please keep them raised. How many of you think that 10% of that list are actually prospects for UCF? All right, you're a very smart audience. How about 5%? How about 1%? The correct answer is 1%. One, 1 if you go down that list, there are between three and six individuals or families that we either already have a very, very strong connection with, some of them have given in the past, and, um, or we think that there is alignment between what UCF represents, whether it's access, whether it's um, our wonderful aeronautics and space flight, that we might be able to map a strategy to them. But we will need your help and we'll need the help of alumni and friends to help get us in front of those right people. So that's really what the capacity piece is about. Let's talk about propensity. Does the person see themselves as a philanthropist? That one's a little harder to quantify. And it really requires dialogue between a gift officer, possibly a faculty member introducing specific, not asking for money, but talking about your work, and the donor, the potential donor. Because I can tell you that we can all say, on average, it takes you know, X number of months to move someone through that critical path I just showed you. The reality is that each conversation is individual, and that follow-up and a continued dialogue is key. And if someone has never made a major gift to either us or another institution, it's going to take longer than it would on average for other individuals. Last but not least, let's talk about affinity. Affinity, I like to think of as what's their UCF story? So when you first get introduced to somebody, it's not uncommon for one of us to say to them, what's your UCF story? Tell us about your connection to UCF. Um, and we, do, we try to do that in a way that doesn't um, make automatic assumptions about who they are. We may know that they're class of 78. We may know that they're successful in their business. But really, our job, again, is to listen. It's to ask the question and be quiet, to pay attention, to ask follow-up questions that actually reveal what they might think is important here at the university. But it's not to go into the room with assumptions. And I think that's probably one of the most important things for you to hear from us, is that we go out and we try to listen. And what we do is come back, and then that's where we really need your help. We may come back with an individual telling us, I really, really am excited about the arts, even though I never stepped foot on stage while I was at UCF. I recently saw an, uh, an interesting ar article on microgrants, and helping students in that way really, really motivates me. Um, and they may say, I'm really impressed with what's happened in UCF athletics recently. Um, but you know what? I'm not somebody who follows football. I really would prefer to talk about women's softball. So our job is to capture that information and to come back and to network with you and with others to figure out how best to engage that donor. And ultimately, to either take you with us or to bring that donor to campus so that they can see how UCF has grown and they can feel the vibrancy of what goes on here on a daily basis. And that's really where the magic happens. 
When we can identify somebody with capacity, with propensity, and with affinity, and we can match that up, you've heard us talk about matchmaking, with a project or research or um, a passion to honor their mother and father by establishing an endowment. That is where the magic really happens. But I wanted to actually ask one of our faculty members, Dr. Tim Hawthorne, to come up and talk about how he worked with us um, to get one of his dreams to come become a reality. And if you will permit me, what I'm going to do is actually read his bio. So, Dr. Hawthorne, as you approach, would you mind, sorry guys, I'm off script here. Dr. Hawthorne is an assistant professor of geographic information systems at University of Central Florida. He is also a 2019 UCF Reach for the Stars awardee. He serves as the State of Florida Geography Steward with National Geographic. He earned his PhD in geography in 2010 from the Ohio State University. He is a broadly trained human geographer with deep interest in citizen science, GIS, community geography, quantitative GIS, and critical GIS. Dr. Hawthorne is also the founding research director of Citizen Science GIS and GeoBus. He's an associate editor for Journal of Geography and the International Journal of Applied Geospatial Research. So with that, welcome. Good afternoon, everybody, and go Knights. Um, I'm the founder of Citizen Science GIS, uh, and, and part of that um, opportunity allows me to work a lot with children. And out in the community, when I'm working with children here in Florida and also down in Central America in the country of Belize, I'm also referred to as Dr. Drone. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Citizen Science GIS at UCF is a group, um, a research group that's full of energetic, passionate, and optimistic scholars. It includes faculty, postdocs and several students, several of which are in the room um, around here as well. And one of the things that I think is the hallmark of our organization is that we believe very firmly in public scholarship. And that's why for us, being at a partnership university is what it's all about. Citizen Science GIS believes that science and society are stronger when we all work together. When we all work together through partnership, actual meaningful partnership. We heard Dr. Dooley and others talk today about the power of listening. That's something that I think sometimes scientists, we kind of forget about that. And our group is all about listening. It's all about engaging community members, community organizations, and community partners that want to engage with us as academics. We've been fortunate to be part of several million dollars in funding and collaborative partnership projects through the National Science Foundation, National Geographic, IBM, and several other foundations. In our research, we use geospatial technologies, very high in-demand technologies, including maps, apps, and drones to engage community members and research scientists and students in some of society's biggest challenges. As part of our, our outreach and education strategies, in the last two years, we've had the privilege of also working with K through 12 teachers and K through 12 students. We've served 4,500 students through a program we call the MAPS, Apps, and Drones Tour that visits K through 12 schools. It has our students that are in the back of the room here visit and mentor the next generation of science. 4,500 students, that's a pretty big number. But we're at UCF, we dream bigger. So what if we could serve up to 15,000 students per year in K through 12 schools across Florida? Today, my friends, I'm excited to share with you our big announcement, our big plan to serve 15,000 students in the K through 12 classrooms of Florida every single year. And that's through a program we're calling GeoBus. The nation's first GeoBus here at UCF is a public-private partnership that takes an old retrofitted city bus that's in the process of being donated by our wonderful friends at Lynx here in Florida 
And we will turn that bus, that old city bus, into a high-tech, in-demand, mobile geospatial technology lab that will visit schools across Florida, especially those schools that do not have access to these geospatial technologies for science education. It's a big idea driven by partnerships, driven by our community partners, driven by our teachers, the advancement team, and faculty, students, and postdocs here at UCF. In thinking about GeoBus, this 40-foot city bus, we have a vision for something big. We want students, K through 12 students, science's next generation, to step into a big idea, a big bus. But more importantly, when they step off of that bus, we want them, we want them to think about something bigger. We want them to dream big. That dream could be becoming the next scientist that makes the next big discovery to change the world. And that also could be them dreaming big, seeing themselves as students at a place like the University of Central Florida. And that for us is what this is all about. It's about cultivating a scientific mindset and an explorer mindset in Central Florida and the state of Florida's youth. Because of pub public and private partnerships, GeoBus is, as I said, just about to become a reality. We are one signature away um, here at UCF from accepting the bus donation from our partners at Lynx. And we're now in the build-out stage where we're actually retrofitting the interior of the bus to create that mobile science laboratory. And those partnerships are only possible between the relationships that we've developed from the College of Sciences, the College of uh, Community Innovation and Education, the advancement team, and all of our wonderful philanthropic donors throughout the region as well. And so I've shared a little bit about our vision. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Ms. J.C. Popple, with the advancement team here at UCF. She's going to share with you a little bit more about the power of partnerships that help, have helped to drive GeoBus here at UCF. So J.C. So as you can imagine, I'm an advancement officer and Dr. Hawthorne comes to me with this big idea. I wanna basically do like a mobile lab with an old bus. And I was like, oh, of course, totally. I'm all, I'm all on board. Um, but the first thing I thought was liability, right? So um, we did our due diligence and we set up meetings across the university with our friends in risk management, public safety, um, our college facilities folks, our foundation leadership, our legal counsel. I can't even count the amount of meetings we had to make sure that this was all approved. And so once we got that green light going, we really got to really think about how we could structure this. So although Dr. Hawthorne is in the College of Sciences, he mentioned kind of working collabor collaboratively across campus, and a big part of this uh, partnership was from our partners in the College of Community, Inno Community Innovation and uh, Education, um, specifically my colleague, Dr. Curtis Proctor, and Dr. Dave Edinburgh, who share that same passion for STEAM education that we do. So we sat down and we created a master list, a quantifiable list that would go from everything from the bus itself to the stations within the bus, what do we need to get this up and running? So one of the first things that we did was we went to the College of Sciences communi uh, communications and marketing teams and we, lent, we leaned on their talents to help us figure out how do we market this, you know, what does it look like? You'll see the picture up there is actually uh, designed by the graphic designer up, uh, on that team. Um, and they really helped us craft a message to really reach the audience we wanted to reach. And so we then sat down and, and thought about all of our contacts. Dr. Hawthorne has a really great vast list of GIS contacts and I was able to utilize our research team at the UCF Foundation to pull possible funders through um, private foundations. And we thought about all the individual donors we know in the STEAM space and we made a great list. And then it hit us, you can't have a geo bus without a bus. So how the heck am I gonna get a 40 foot bus, which I tell Dr. Hawthorne that I'm going to park at his house. I don't, did we discuss that already? I, I think it's agreed. So, so how do we get a bus? So we, uh, again, we made a, a big list of who the major players were in the bus landscape and we uh, thought through who our contacts were and thankfully we were able to find an internal champion at Lynx who uh, got us a meeting in front of Lynx leadership. So we went, and as you can tell from hearing from Dr. Hawthorne, his passion is contagious, and they immediately were on board with the GeoBus idea, agreeing then and there to provide us with an older 
an older but equally amazing 40-foot bus, uh, and then they were uh, willing to um, remove the seats and do a number of other things to really make it up and running as part of their in-kind donation. So as Dr. Hawthorne mentioned, we are one signature away um, from closing this Lynx deal, and we will be able to start... It's not, trust me, I would have already mentioned it. Doc, <laughs> trust me, I would have been like, hint, 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 Dr. Dooley. No, it's not her. It's not her. But thank you for advocating for us. In public. Right, right. No pressure. No pressure. That person's not here, so I think we're in the clear. So we were able, by working together on this project, Dr. Hawthorne was able to be laser focused on not only the GeoBus, but all of his other academic endeavors. And I was able to work on the advancement side in identifying potential donors and making sure that we um, dot all the I's and cross the T's to make sure that everything was on the up and up. Uh, once the keys are in hand, the doors are wide open for potential donor support uh, to outfit the inside of the bus, the overall operations of the bus, and we're just spreading like wildfire that this is a really great opportunity with our corporate partners, and the buzz is, is really out there. <clears throat> I've since transitioned to a different team um, in, the, in the advancement um, office, but uh, Dr. Hawthorne has been working very closely with my colleagues, uh, Millie Erickson and Catherine Mata, over in the College of Sciences to take what we started and really take it to the next level. So with that, I would encourage faculty here today to connect with your advancement teams and your colleges and units. Tell them your crazy ideas. I mean, if we can do a mobile science bus, I think we can do anything. So talk to your advancement officers. You've got just an immense amount of talent in your backyard. And uh, when you're on the streets, make sure you wave and give us a honk. We'll see you out there. Thank you. And with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague, Pat Crowley, who is going to wrap us up by talking about stewardship. In the essence of time, I can wrap it up with this. Stewardship. Thank you. I was at an award ceremony one time that just droned on forever, and the award recipient haven't e hasn't even spoken. All these people kept standing up saying all these wonderful things. They finally called her up, and she said, thank you so much. And then she walked away, and the guy I was sitting next to said, that was the best thing she ever said. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I can just leave you with this, really, in the essence of time. Yeah, it is really all of our jobs for stewardship, and we can't short shrift that because once we get the gift, it, it, it isn't done. The work is not done. You've heard from Karen and others talking about we must be transparent with our donors and showing impact as best as we can. From the foundation perspective, I think that we provide an umbrella stewardship, a very administrative thing to some degree, but we acknowledge gifts within 48 hours of, of receipt. Uh, we have events, we do many other things, but a lot of it happens on the grassroots level. I ask, may, maybe for some of us who have been around for a while, who's famous for saying all politics is local? Yeah, Tip O'Neill, God bless him. I want to go have a beer with that guy. Well, you can't anymore, but he, you know, he was just a, you know, an old style politician said all politics is local and I can really leave you with this with stewardship that's what it is it's the the central foundation or central advancement can really provide an umbrella stewardship so you know the basics are happening but it really boils down to what you can do if a donor perhaps you hold an endowed faculty position or they've supported your department in some way, how could you personally reach out to that donor and let the folks in advancement know we can help you in any way that you need it? Uh, I gave the example of a donor uh, that I worked with years ago at another institution. He was on the University Board of Trustees. He was a past foundation board member and, of course, a donor. And he stopped me and he said, you can't believe what I just got the other day. He said, my phone went off. He was having lunch with his wife. And it was, it was a text message, and it was a video, and he, he got it. He's, one of the many things he supported was women's soccer. And somehow, a few of the women's soccer players knew it was his birthday. And they just got their iPhone, went out into the field, and just said, hey, Mr., you know, change the name. Hey, Mr. Smith, we just wanted to say happy birthday and let you know we really support, or we really are happy and thankful for all that you do for us. And they sent that video off, because that was the best 
thank you I ever received. And sitting around the table when we were talking about one of the questions Karen had as far as how you were thanked, think what's meaningful for you, and then how the uh, Central Foundation can help you in any way that, that they can. So with that, I'll just leave it, but it is, it's all of our jobs, um, and the job isn't finished just because we got the gift. We're relationship building, uh, we're in it for the long haul, but we can't do it without you. So thank you. Thank you, Pat. I, I appreciate you uh, speeding that along because we do want to get people out on time. He had a lot of really cool slides uh, we can share with you at a later, later date. So I wanted to wrap up with just sort of five big takeaways and then we'll do some Q&A. Um, uh, I believe that's what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. So, number one, the Ignite campaign is finishing strong. Um, um, we are going to cross the $500 million threshold. We'll celebrate that milestone and the end of the campaign again at homecoming in October. Two, we're here for you. Uh, again, we're in the business of helping the university. Uh, we wanna help the faculty uh, with your needs. Uh, we wanna help with student needs, um, uh, university-wide initiatives, small projects and large. Uh, please bring them forward. But know that we have to look at things with a somewhat cynical eye. We have to ask questions. We have to get things cleared. Three, uh, participate with us. Let's, let's make this a team. Four, philanthropy at UCF is charging on. Um, and stewardship matters. One other thing uh, I'll mention about the stewardship part that Pat uh, brought up. Um, another common misconception is about naming opportunities. Um, and, uh, and, and I've noticed this um, among faculty and staff that everybody believes the big gifts are all generated and driven by putting someone's name on a building or a floor or an auditorium or this or that. Um, that's not true. If we were doing a true-false, that would be a false. While some people are motivated by that legacy, in fact, many are not. And some, sitting in this room, would tell you that's the last thing they would want. Some people don't want that kind of a public attention. And the one other thing I'll mention about people and organizations uh, of means is beyond the impact, the inclination, propensity, their capacity, their engagement and involvement, um, it, 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 keep in mind that um, uh, the only way we'll get to understand um, what their needs are is really uh, by listening and, and we we really can't steer a donor towards one thing more than another. Our goal is to maximize donor potential. And so in the example of Dean Johnson uh, with the Rosengrins, uh, what started as one gift blossomed into many others as we learn more about them and they learn more about us. That's where the action is. And uh, I think while $100 million this year is, uh, is a record breaker for the campaign and something to be proud of, we have only scratched the surface on our potential. Uh, if we can continue to engage uh, alumni and other constituencies, corporations, foundations, parents, and all of you in this room, um, the sky's the limit on what we can bring in philanthropically. So I will stop there. I thank you and we'll open it up to some questions. Any questions? None? Yes. What do you expect to be the direction of advancement you know, after June 30th? What are we going to be doing? Great question. Um, yeah, uh, for what it's worth, um, you know, uh, campaigns never really end in some ways. Um, a campaign is, is sort of an artificial platform by which we stand up priorities and put together uh, a narrative to try to bring people in and engage them. As soon as this campaign ends, we'll start the, you know, the, the kind of groundwork on what that next big thing is. It clearly, some of our planning has been set back a little bit by the transition relative to presidential uh, reality here, um, but it won't change uh, uh, or slow us down from engaging as many people as possible. It might slow down some really big gifts, because I'll tell you, you know, at the million dollar plus threshold, these people more often than not want to meet the president, want to know that their long-term pledge 
will be stewarded and taken care of. Um, others will jump into the vacuum and into the void and say, I want to be that leader. I want to be the one that says UCF is forever. So um, I think you can always count on students and, and scholarship being a priority, faculty and research being a priority, and then special projects uh, uh, coming along. Uh, sometimes they're capital projects, sometimes they'll be endowment initiatives, but whatever's important to you is important to us, and ultimately, if we can marry that with what's important to our donors, uh, good things will come our way. So don't be surprised if three or four years from now, um, if we're launching publicly the next great initiative, um, what will that number be? I don't know. We will do feasibility testing where we'll go out and interview our top donors and prospects, ask them what they think of us right now, test some priorities with them and we'll go from there. But we don't blindly, we'll just, you know, we had 500 million in this campaign, can we do a billion in the next? I don't know, you, you have to test those things. So stay tuned, but I, I think over the course of eight or 10 years, we, we could potentially do that. Anyone else? Then I'm gonna hand it off to Lisa. Thank you very much. Do you have at least one takeaway or new one new insight relating to fundraising from today? Let me round of applause. Excellent. Great job. Great job, Mike and your team. So I'm Dr. Lisa Jones, and I'm Associate Provost for Strategy, and it's my honor to transition us to the Marchioli Collective Impact Innovation um, Award presentation. And I'd be remiss if I too, and I'm gonna move to the next slide and move along, didn't thank you, Nelson, uh, for your generosity. Uh, this award, award would not be possible without you. And as Dr. Dooley said, you are planting seeds. And I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that it's certainly the award, and to date, every award recipient has poured that award back into creating impact in their program. But it goes beyond that as well. Each award recipient holds a seminar on campus that's open to the campus community in which they share how they got partnerships, how they received funding, um, you know, how they even documented the impacts, and it pays it forward, and they help and nurture others who want to uh, start an innovation. So I wanted to make sure you knew that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the Dean of the College of Community Innovation and Education to introduce our award recipient. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you again, Mr. Marchioli, for engaging in the university in the, the very special ways that you do. Uh, you know, when we think about education um, and supporting high needs populations, we often think about supporting children who are growing up in poverty, maybe uh, children with special learning needs or physical needs. Um, we think about children whose home language is not English and we have to provide them special help, and those are certainly true. But when I met uh, Dr. Megan Nichols, in 2015 when she joined our faculty, she brought a, a new awareness to me. I'm a former classroom teacher, but it never occurred to me that there's a population of children who are spending a significant amount of their time and their families are spending time, their siblings, their, their moms, dads, and others in the hospital. Uh, these are children with critical and terminal illnesses. And Megan Nichols has developed a program and has involved students and other faculty members and now has a, a full-fledged uh, partnership with Nemours Children's, Children's Hospital called P Peds Academy that serves these children and their families. And it is an absolute honor to be in the same room with her and her team, her students and faculty members, to know that she's been mentored by people like um, Pegasus Professor and her school head, Dr. Mike Hines, uh, Pegasus Professor Dr. Lisa Deeker, who's not here today, and others across the university, uh, Dr. Stella Sung in um, Cobb, um, and others. She's made some great choices, but she has this, this brain that sees things differently than a lot of us do. So without any more from me, Megan Nichols and her team. Thank you, Dean Carroll. Um, is, I 
should have asked ahead of time if there was a clicker or I'll just I'll thumbs up and point, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, it really is such an honor uh, to receive this award in recognition of UCF's Peds Academy at Nemours Children's Hospital and to get to share more about what this exciting program is. And I'd like to begin by sharing one of our videos that really captures the heart of Peds Academy. Medical advances for children with chronic and complex medical conditions have advanced at a really rapid rate and education hasn't caught up with those children or, or kept up uh, with medical advances. So even children who face some of the most insidious diseases now, they survive. And very simply put, the, the cost of living cannot be education. Peds Academy, it's the world's first pediatric school program that's research-backed and dedicated to educating children in ways that are specific to their disease, phenotype, or condition. Sometimes being in the hospital is, is stressful. It can be stressful for the parents, stressful for the, the patient, obviously. And we are always looking for ways to try to make that experience a little easier to cope with. And whether it's a surgical procedure or you know a day in the infusion center, you know, if, if they are engaged, if their mind is engaged, I think the whole experience goes so much better. You see them light up, you see their enthusiasm. I think it makes a world of difference. Our purpose is to provide those really rich, meaningful educational experiences so that children aren't just keeping pace with their healthy, typically developing peers, but that they're actually getting extraordinary educational opportunities like robotics and immersive and augmented virtual reality while they're here in the hospital. Do you feel yourself? I see a sea turtle, Mom, you're jealous. Well, she definitely enjoys putting the, making the robots do, yeah. you know, all kind of silly things. The challenge of learning whenever you're in and out of the hospital is that there's no consistency. So it helps to have someone else come in that's to kind of explain things. I'm not good at explaining them to her. Some parents, when they learn what this is, have been immediately brought to tears, just tears of joy that they're gonna have some support in being able to navigate the education for their child while they go through this, this experience, which in some cases will span years. I think it's definitely gonna help her whenever she goes back to school. It's so exciting. It's such a high level of motivation for them that what we see in Peace Academy is, yes, I'll do that thing. We're, we're having to set time limits and say, okay, we've got to move on to the next uh, room and you know we'll be back tomorrow. But I think some of them would keep us in there all day. Thank you. Um, building Peds Academy had really been a dream of mine for the past seven years uh, since I first walked into a children's hospital when I was doing my doctorate at, at Illinois State as a volunteer teacher. And at that time, I became aware of an entire population of children who, by all accounts, um, were invisible and, and largely, unfortunately, still remain invisible in the field of education. And I saw children who had been out of school for weeks, months, and even years. And not only do they face complex medical issues, but they also face the added challenges of, of not being in uh, regular schooling, falling behind in their schoolwork, of course, missing the social benefits that come along with schooling, and being set back in a way that ultimately uh, limits their intellectual development, their lives, and their long-term social mobility. So the plan with Peds Academy was to go far beyond the minimum, to provide hospitalized children with an experience that, like uh, I say in the video, is not just keeping pace with their healthy, typically developing peers, but one that gives them an extraordinary opportunity and a leg up to help them excel. Peds Academy is designed to help children re-enter their school as critical problem solvers and flexible thinkers. It is the world's first pediatric school program that is specific to disease or condition and uses an in-house curriculum to address issues related to uh, treatment and, and disease. 
The instruction in Peds Academy is, of course, centered around STEM topics and helping children learn more about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The lessons are taught by UCF professors and student teachers and student teachers, excuse me, in colleges from around campus. We use technology that is exciting, engaging, and educational, robotics, and immers immersive virtual reality. In our virtual classrooms that we are rolling out this spring, the children of Nemours embody their own avatars and can take classes together in the, inside the Louvre, on the surface of Mars, um, in the ocean, wherever the, the, the content takes us. And of course, the, the teaching practices themselves and the curriculum are based on cognitive development, medicine, and specific subject areas, such as mathematical thinking and learning, and the effects of selected diseases and treatments. What is also unique is the scale of Peds Academy. We harness UCF's size to bring more than 50 faculty and students on site Monday through Friday. Our students are education majors, biology majors, biomed majors, and many more. Their time at Peds Academy is comprised of classroom instruction, learning to teach mathematics, reading, special education practices, shadowing faculty members who are teaching the children of Nemours, and ultimately conducting the teaching themselves. Their instruction is from both our faculty as well as Nemours staff and physicians, and I'd like to acknowledge some of my faculty who are here today. Dr. Linda Walters, who snuck in the back, Dr. Leanne Spaulding and Dr. Michelle Kelly, who are on site um, devoting their time to our student teachers as well. Our student teachers learn how to teach a vulnerable population, and they become proficient in STEM instruction. And after participating in their cohort internship at Peds Academy, they're able to enter the real world environment and which ultimately prepares them to teach in our community schools, classrooms, or healthcare settings. UCF and Nemour share a similar vision to transform lives and livelihoods. And Peds Academy allows us to bring the best of both worlds together to offer a level of education and enrichment that is now the best of its kind for hospitalized children. Um, I could talk about Peds Academy at, at great length, but what I wanted to do this afternoon is to allow you to hear from two of our student teaching interns. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jessica and Jacob, who will share their experiences with Peds Academy. Hi, so um, Dr. Nichols offered me the role to come here and kind of tell you a little bit about my remarks and how this experience has shaped me for my future. Um, my name is Jacob Romiak, and I'm currently a junior studying biomedical sciences and a part of the Coastal Estuarine and Ecology Lab with Dr. Walters in the bi biology de department. Since joining the lab in the fall of 2018, I've gained a great amount of passion for the field of conservation and for the study of birds, which has led me to my own research studying wading bird diversity and abundance in Mosquito Lagoon. This study is geared towards studying the ecological role of birds and how they can act as biological indicators. An added element of the study is to assist children at Peds Academy as they engage in their own study of bird diversity. Back in December, Dr. Walters and Dr. Nichols gave me the opportunity to combine my research and future career as an orthopedic surgeon. With this, we found an innovative way to involve children as citizen scientists in this project, hoping to both benefit their well-being and contribute to regional environmental protection. At the time, I didn't realize how much Peds Academy would impact my life, not only as an undergraduate researcher or a student, but as a human being. My time in Moores is spent bedside with children, educating them on the importance of Mosquito Lagoon as an estuary and the role of birds as keystone species, and furthermore, allowing them to embark on this journey as an expert ornithologist. Upon introducing myself to children and their families, I urge that their, their assistance on this project is needed and make it a point that their contributions are important. 
Their Help in My Study serves as an educational platform where these children have the opportunity to learn about surrounding ecosystems through literature resources and ornithology identifying technology. In the short amount of time I spend with these children, I strive to educate them on the importance of birds, identifying bird species and activity, and elements of research. As I continue this research, I strive to con look at creative ways to get children involved through Legos, animated books written by Dr. Walters herself, and robotics. Since beginning this project with Peds Academy, I have worked with individuals from diverse backgrounds and have the opportunity to be a part of the first ever program geared towards educating those with chronic illnesses. With each encounter, a new lesson was learned. I quickly realized that this was not only a life experience for each child, but one for me as well, an experience that I will never forget and always cherish. This experience has given me access to one-on-one -on -one patient interaction, knowledge of pediatrics, and the ability to experience education in a hospital care setting. I know that as I apply to medical schools this summer and become an orthopedic surgeon, the lessons learned in this program will prepare me for anything the future has in store. And with that, thank you. And I'd like to welcome Jessica. Hello. My name is Jessica Doyle, and I am a senior here at UCF. I will be graduating in the fall with my degree in elementary education. To give you a full glimpse of my journey with Peds Academy, I have to start in August of 2016. It was then that my mom was diagnosed with stage four liver cancer. It was a sudden shock and blow to my family, and she immediately started treatment in Tampa at a hospital, hospital each week. While she went there for chemotherapy, what she ended up finding was a hospital staff that was encouraging, supportive, and saw her through some of the darkest days that she had yet faced. It was that experience that inspired me to apply when I heard about the opportunity to join Pete's Academy. I saw it as a chance to be the support and encouragement that I knew from experience is so vital in a hospital setting. I remember being nervous the first couple days. I wasn't sure if the kids were going to want to do school or if that was gonna be high on their list of priorities. What I found out was not only did they want to do it, they were happy to do it. There are many times where I'd be standing in an elevator with one of our dash robots, which we use for math lessons, and a kid would get in, a patient would get in, and they would say, oh, are you coming to my room next? They were so excited. There were other times where I would walk in with a lesson on multiplication, and they were more than happy to do it. And now that we have our Peds Academy classroom set up at Nemours, kids are requesting to come in sometimes several times per day. Not only does this affect the kids, but it also affects the parents. There were often times where I would tell them what we were doing and I would see a look of relief as their child's education is just an added thing on the list of worries that they have. Oftentimes I saw tears of gratefulness and received hugs of appreciation. It made me realize that children in hospitals are in many ways a forgotten demographic and are often neglected by the academic world. Peds Academy has decided to step up to the plate not only to recognize the need, but to meet the need. And I was grateful to be a part of the process that met these needs. Little did I know though, just how much this process would in turn affect me. I was excited to help out at the hospital and I knew I would be making some sort of impact, but what I could not have predicted was how brave, genuine, eager to learn, and happy these kids were in the midst of so much pain, hardship, and confusion, and how much they would in turn teach me. It was truly inspiring in more ways than one. There were often times where I would step outside of a room after finishing a lesson and would just have to sit there and reflect on what happened and the families and the children that I encountered because it was a lot. They were going through a lot and they were still happy to have you in their, in their room. These opportunities were so unique and were possible because of the resources, technology, and people like Dr. Nichols who are willing to make it happen. To conclude, Peds Academy gave me a humbling opportunity to serve and grow not only as a future teacher and current student, but as a person. I am walking away with invaluable knowledge that will affect the way I teach and treat not only my students and their families, but the people around me. It has helped to widen my horizon when it comes to how I view the world, and I'm so grateful for it all. Thank you so much. Well, 
that was absolutely amazing. Our students charge on to all of you. But Dr. Nichols, would you please take the stage with your dean, please? And Mr. Marciola, will you join us as well? And I know this is not scripted, but Mr. Marciola, would you like to say something? I'm good. You're good? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Megan, Dr. Nichols, for all that you have done, when we talked about planting the seeds and I talked about investing in the small things, but bringing about the greatest impact and we're impacting so much more through the work that you do. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the University of Central Florida, we can clap, congratulate you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all. to our presenters and all those who played a role in this event. Thank you all so much. Let me give you one housekeeping note. On April 4th, we'll have our next Provost Forum titled Advancing Research and Graduate Students, and that will be presented by Dr. Liz Klonoff. Thank you all so much. <laughs>